Hello dear aspirants, welcome to this special discussion on contemporary topics organized by Vision IAS. So today I am joined by our esteemed faculty for environment, Geetika ma'am, to discuss on an important contemporary topic which not only shapes our present, past as well as future, which is climate change and its implications and international initiatives. So ma'am, a very warm welcome to you ma'am. Hello Ramakan. So ma'am, as we are experiencing heat waves and extreme weather events, these days, would you attribute this to climate change? Well, climate change, you know, is a very broad term. Uh, it is, uh, it is a long-term shift that we have observed in the temperatures as well as uh, extreme weather events that are taking place. Yeah. So, the current heat wave that we are experiencing is about 0.5 to 1 degree Celsius above the average temperatures that are normally seen. So, there is no doubt about the fact that yes, climate change is responsible for the increase in intensity as well as frequency of heat waves and other extreme events. Right ma'am. So ma'am, that now that you have discussed that climate change is real and it's happening. So, what are the causes behind uh, the climate change phenomenon that is happening? Climate change phenomena that we are observing, which is essentially global warming, which is an increase in the average global temperatures, is primarily on account of increase in the greenhouse gases that we are witnessing. After the industrial revolution, you know, in about 18th century onwards, we have seen an increase in the rise of greenhouse gases, for example, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen trifluoride. These are gases which have been on the rise. And the, the property of these gases is that they, you know, absorb heat from long wave terrestrial radiation. That means radiation which is given out by the earth. Because of this trapping of heat, the average temperature of earth and its atmosphere is rising. Right ma'am. Ma'am, now that you have talked about the causes or rather the most important cause of climate change. So, how do we tackle climate change ma'am? Now, climate change emergency or the climate crisis is something that demands action from all of us not just you know uh, from the international or national level but also from individual and community point of view so for example people should rely more on public transport use more energy efficient lighting they should probably you know source food and products from local places rather than you know abroad importing food or fruits other things from abroad because that increases the carbon footprint Apart from that, a very interesting observation is that people should rely more and more on plant-based diet because uh, about 60% of our agricultural land is used by livestock, you know, for grazing purposes. Now, because of that, what is happening is, as we all know, livestock, you know, they emit a lot of methane. So, that is also causing an increase in the greenhouse gases. So, a plant-based diet will help not only for, you know, climate change, but also as a healthier option as opposed to a meat-based diet. So, apart from the initiatives at the individual and community level, there are also many international initiatives, domestic legislations that have been, you know, brought about by countries and global organizations to tackle climate change. Ma'am, a very interesting point that you made now, that international initiatives. So, now, to focus on this, ma'am, if you could highlight what are these international initiatives that have been taken to tackle climate change? Okay, so Ramagand, I'll just give you a brief history about how the evolution of international, you know, fora has, you know, the, how they have come about with the solutions for climate change. Let's go back to 1972. In 1972, there was a conference which was held in Stockholm, okay, and the name of the conference was United Nations Conference on Human Environment, where we were just trying to assess that how the human environment, because humans were at the center, we considered ourselves at the center of environment and how it is changing around us. In this convention, about 26 principles were, you know, understood and adopted and it was realized that yes, the climate is changing. For the first time, there was a global, you know, uh, at the international level first time a proper conference was held where environment was treated as a major theme now from 1972 cut to 1988 in 1988 uh, it, it was realized everybody was understanding during the interim period that yes we are our environment is changing the climate is changing everyone could observe it but it was not backed by any scientific evidence so in 1988 
we uh, the united nations environment program which was launched in the 72 conference the united nations environment program along with world meteorological organization started the ipcc that is the intergovernmental panel on climate change now this was a scientific body which had to come up with data which had to back its you know findings with statistical data and evidences that would tell that yes actually climate is changing so ipcc that was launched in 1988 came up with its first assessment report in 1990 that is 2 years later and the report said that yes not only are we witnessing a change in the climate but already the global average temperatures have risen by 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 degrees celsius so we are already you know in a phase of climate change now when this scientific back data came about countries realized that okay some action has to be taken because of which they all decided to have another conference in 1992 which was called the united nations conference on environment and development now if you think about the 90s decade you know 1991 india underwent an economic crisis so this was a decade where a lot of countries who had recently achieved independence they were also focusing on their development and economic needs so development came as a you know parallel goal so if you remember the stockholm convention was on human environment and this became environment and development Right. So, in 1992, when this conference was held in Rio de Janeiro, that is in Brazil, it was also called Rio Summit. So, this became one focal, uh, you know, conference where many important initiatives were launched. One of which was UNFCCC, that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Apart from that, there was Agenda 21, there was Convention on Biological Diversity, many other were also, you know, this was the birthplace, you can say, of all these conventions. With respect to climate change, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, this came about in 1992. And after two years, the convention came into force. So, 94, the convention had already come into force. Now, if you think about it, what is a convention? Convention merely gives you a framework that this is the goal, you know, this is the overarching topic that we have to deal with. To bring about a change at the ground level, you need some specific measures and targets. And those come in the form of a protocol, right? So, in 94, when this convention was brought into force, the meeting was held the very next year in 95, that was the COP1, where it was decided that, okay, lots of talk is going on, but we need some legally binding treaty, which will tell the countries that you have to reduce your emissions. Some solid action, some solid action on the ground is required, right. right? So, in 95, this came about and, you know, uh, in pursuance of that, in 1997 came the Kyoto Protocol. Now, Kyoto Protocol told was basically based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. It acknowledged the fact that although everybody is experiencing the same amount of you know, problem with respect to climate change, but not everyone is equally the culprit. There are developed countries who have been historically making larger amount of emissions and they are also better equipped to deal with that as opposed to developing countries who are facing the brunt of the problem but at the same time do not have enough resources or probably have not contributed to that many emissions. So Kyoto came about with the principle of CBDR and it was decided that Kyoto protocol you know uh, will basically target developed countries or it will give targets to developed countries that you should reduce your emissions by so and so amount. Now, this happened in 97. Now, in order to bring the Kyoto Protocol into effect, there were two conditions. Condition number one was that at least 55 countries should have ratified. So, when I say ratified, that means you are bringing about a domestic legislation in order to execute those, you know, points that have been given in the convention. And those countries, whichever countries have, you know, ratified it, they should account for 55% of the global emissions. Then only there is a point of having a treaty into effect. So, this happened in 1997. Now, the, you know, the interim period, it took so long for countries 
to finally bring the Kyoto Protocol into implementation. So, Kyoto Protocol came into effect in 2005. Now, the interesting thing here is that it did come into effect, but the largest, you know, emitter, which was USA, they, he did not, it did not join the protocol. USA was opposed to the idea that somebody should tell them what is the amount of emissions that they should reduce. So, because of this, in uh, after 2005, in 2009, USA came up with the idea that rather than someone else telling us what is the emissions that we should cut down, maybe countries should give their own contribution or give their own, you know, uh, statements or their intentions as to what is the amount of carbon emissions they want to reduce. So, USA was joined by European Union basic countries in this uh, concept. So, it was later realized that yes, if we have to go forward in the climate negotiations, this is the way forward. And accordingly, in COP21, that is in 2015, Paris Agreement came into, you know, came as a, it was a deal which was agreed to, in which it was decided that countries will give their own contribution rather than being told by somebody that this is the amount of emissions they have to reduce. So, this was like a win-win situation because emissions are also getting reduced, but at the same time, countries can make their own pledges. Now, Not important, man. Yeah, which is important because you have to have the willingness of the country to change. So, after this, in 2015, we move to 2021, which is COP26 in Glasgow, where India made its contribution or pledge in the form of a Panchamrit statement, you know, in which they gave five goals that India is going to achieve. First was that we will have 500 gigawatts of non-fossil energy, non-fossil fuel based energy. 50% of our energy requirements will come from renewable energy. We will reduce our emissions by, you know, about 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We will also reduce the emission intensity of our economy by 45 percent from 2005 levels by 2030 and all in all we will become a carbon neutral country by 2070. So, India gave its pledge in the form of a Panchamrit pledge in Glasgow COP26. Right ma'am. Ma'am, India has always been an active participant in the climate summits. Right. Ma'am, now that we have discussed, you know, a very comprehensive understanding about you know how uh, the climate summits have evolved, how the actions uh, have been taken and it has been a very step by step process. Uh, so, despite all of these, uh, we still feel that you know climate change is still a bigger issue or something that is confronting the mankind uh, till today. So, what are the challenges ma'am uh, which is actually hindering the progress to fight climate change? Well, all the countries, like I told you, they are making efforts, they are giving out their, you know, nationally determined contributions as to what they can do. But two points which stick out in almost every climate negotiation, first is climate finance. Countries have pledged, developed countries have pledged that we will give about, you know, 100 billion a year, but obviously that kind of money is not being raised. Second is technology transfer. Even if countries have the kind of, you know, maybe resources, but they don't have the technological know-how, especially developing countries, they don't have the technological know-how to implement climate smart solutions. Apart from that, political will, that is a major issue, right? Because countries like India and other developing countries, their priority will be development issues, economic issues. We are still a country which is reeling under poverty, hunger, malnutrition. So, that will be our priority. And of course, there is lack of awareness in people also, sometimes at the local level, community level, climate smart solutions are still not being adopted. So, these are some of the challenges because of which we are, you know, not able to actually see through action. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, you talked about in India's, you know, uh, contribution and uh, despite being a developing country, it is trying to do a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, taking it forward, are there any steps that government of India is taking? in this regard 
do you know to mitigate climate change yes absolutely government of india is uh, taking uh, in lot of steps especially in the form of an umbrella scheme called the national action plan on climate change which has a component related to solar energy which has a component related to sustainable habitat energy efficiency uh, himalayan protection of himalayan ecosystem strategic knowledge on climate change so there are six submissions which are you know which are still a part of napcc and apart from that government is heavily focusing on energy efficiency because energy we are a highly uh, you know energy dependent country especially uh, still on fossil fuels coal uh, petroleum we are heavily dependent on that for our energy needs so we are used trying to move to more energy efficient so for example we have the pat scheme that is a perform achieve and trade scheme which has been uh, initiated by bureau of energy efficiency that means you save energy and you get a certificate from be that is an energy certificate uh, saving certificate which you can trade in the market so it's like an incentive for companies to you know uh, cap their energy uh, requirements apart from that there is ujala scheme like for you know good lighting led bulbs and all those kind of initiatives we also have uh, cleaner fuel technologies so national hydrogen mission biomass generation gobardhan so the in those ways government is moving towards alternative cleaner fuels and cleaner technologies so that's a lot of initiatives that's that india is absolutely. taking ma'am right ma'am so ma'am uh, moving forward now that you have discussed comprehensively you know that how climate change has been a, been a problem and then there have been initiatives both internationally and domestically uh, and the steps that have been taken now moving towards this topic as such uh, being important uh, for upsc and uh, what is the relevance of this topic ma'am if you could highlight comprehensively for the students well climate change is a very important topic uh, not just from like a layman perspective but also from the examination point of view because uh, it is something that we are experiencing on a day to day basis and it's frequently seen in the newspapers and uh, upsc has time and again asked questions on climate change so if i were to let's say categorize environment uh, in the last 7 years we have seen about 16 to 17 questions solely on climate change which means about 2 to 3 questions every year apart from that uh, if you talk about the mains examination again upsc has asked very specific questions on climate change so for example in 2017 they asked that climate change is a global problem but what is its impact for india and not just india what is its impact for himalayan states and coastal states in india in 2021 when we came up with our glasgow you know commitments in the form of panchamrit upsc asked you know what was our commitment and what was the outcome of cop26 so with respect to climate change upsc has asked questions not only in the form of a concept of climate change its causes impact mitigation what all you can do but also from the international you know convention point of view what are the you know steps that are being taken and what is happening on the international arena right ma'am so it seems like it is one of the favorite topics Absolutely. for upsc ma'am now going forward then how does an aspirant prepare this topic holistically if you could throw light on that ma'am yes so uh, climate change is a very broad topic it has to be understood from various perspectives uh, first and foremost is if you divide uh, you know climate action we can you know understand that climate action can be done at the individual and community level and it can be done at the international and national legislation level so first you can understand it as what it, an individual can do and what is the role of a government what is the role of an international body so one is the scale of the problem and the solution second is we should understand climate change not only from this perspective but also adaptation and mitigation these are two separate problems mitigation means where i'm trying to reduce my emissions in order to prevent further worsening and adaptation means whatever damage has been done i am trying to adapt to it so for example maybe i am trying to grow more uh, you know drought resilient crops so that is a form of adaptation where i know drought will occur but my crops will survive so that is one perspective and finally of course there is you know a technology because upsc has asked a question on uh, uh, you know cleaner technologies especially uh, related to climate change in the essay in the form of an essay in 2018 they asked a question on alternative technologies so you have to understand from the technological point of view what are the different solutions that can be you know brought about and also climate finance is one topic which was an absolute sticking point in all climate negotiations and you can expect a question around it any given time right ma'am 
So ma'am, climate change, climate change, as it seems that this topic is overlapping across papers and is quite critical from the UPSC or the exam point of view as well. So ma'am, any final words of advice for the students, particularly on this topic or in general, if you could highlight. Right. So uh, Ramakant, if you see the climate negotiations, I've given you a brief history of the timeline. If you look at the way forward, now Paris Agreement was something which had to be done in cycles of five years. So first cycle went on from let's say 2020 to 2025. In 2025, we again have to renew our nationally determined contribution. So students should be on the lookout for that as to what is the upgrade that we make there. And on account of that, we have recently, you know, in 2023, given the first global stock take. That means countries have been assessed that what have you done so far, how successful has it been and how are you going to upgrade it in 2025. So like so a this progress is, report. Yes, yeah, this is like a progress report. It's like a report card. How well have you done, right? So this is a topic which can be, you know, uh, expected in the examination global stock tech because this is like a ground reality of what is actually being done. This is one important thing. Apart from that, uh, all the things that I told you, adaptation, mitigation, students, uh, I, I would just feel that they should always keep an eye for news that is coming related to climate change and India's position with respect to that. So, for example, India works on the principle of equity, CBDR. That is, these are principles that, uh, you know, define the base or foundation of our strategy and policy in climate negotiations. Right, ma'am. So ma'am, so in this case, the newspaper remains to be key in yeah. terms of tracking all the news related to all these events or the topics that you highlighted right. within climate change. So ma'am, thank you for sharing your valuable insights mm -hmm. and such a comprehensive understanding about the topic and its criticality uh, to the exam as well. Thank you ma'am. Thank you for having me. So dear students, with this comprehensive understanding of the topic, which is so critical for both prelims and mains, I'm sure this is going to benefit you. All the very best for prelims and mains. Stay focused. All the very best. Until then, keep watching Vision Eyes.